Well, good evening, everyone. It sure is good to see y'all. It would help if I turned my microphone on, though. That would be very helpful. We are going to uh, continue our class in Hebrews in just a moment. We're going to be wrapping up the second section of the first main point of the main section of the book in just a second. But um, as we as we uh, uh, get there, uh, we do have a couple of announcements we want to throw out there first. Um, we will uh, not have ladies' class in the morning. Um, as I mentioned at the last ladies' class, uh, Liz, or not Liz and I, but I will be going um, to uh, see my parents uh, tomorrow the next day. So uh, no ladies' class in the morning, but we will resume that next week. Um, also keep in mind a couple things coming up. Next Sunday, this, this coming Sunday, um, is uh, the elders and deacons will meet. So if you have anything uh, that you want to make aware to them, please uh, let them know. Also, um, on the 30th, which would be not next Wednesday night, but the Wednesday night after that, uh, we will have a singing over at Memphis, I believe is where it is, right? Yeah. Memphis, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll have a singing at Memphis, so no uh, no uh, service here that time. Uh, again, not this coming Wednesday, but the next Wednesday, uh, we'll all be over at Memphis, so keep that in mind as well. That's all the announcements that I am aware of. Um, well, okay, let me throw one more thing out there. Uh, if I understood correctly from Beth, um, Fred's uh, PET scan basically showed that things are going the way they need to and there weren't any surprises. So I'm thankful for that. I want to continue to keep him in our prayers. Uh, and that's the only <laughs> update that I'm aware of of those we've been praying for uh, recently. So any other uh, things we need to mention? Yes, Dan. And the elder over at Clarence and John White. Uh huh. He's in the hospital in Amarillo. Oh. Heart problems. I okay. talked to his son, Randy, today. Okay. Yes, Don White uh, in the hospital with uh, heart problems uh, over at Clarence. Do what? He's in BSA. In BSA, okay, thank you. Anything else we need to mention before we get started tonight? Well, one more thing I will mention. Uh, we had the breakfast yesterday morning. That went really well. We had a great turnout. Um, all, the, all the boys showed up, and they just about ate us out of house and home, but we had plenty, so it was all good, so. No, we really, really enjoyed that. We really loved having them there. That all went really good. So thank you all again, as I've said several times, for your support of that and for contributing to that and just that, everything involved with that. So thankful for that. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we will get into Hebrews. Our Father, God in heaven, Lord, we approach your throne, and we are thankful. Father, this is something that we know you don't get tired of hearing, and that we hope we never get tired of saying because everything in our lives that is good ultimately comes from you. And Father, we would be remiss if we did not thank you at every opportunity. Lord, we have so many blessings both in this life, but most importantly, blessings as we move towards the next, that we can all point back to you, Father. And we pray, especially as we will be studying you tonight, that you would help us to remember what we are striving for. Father, what you have given us in this life is ultimately to help us uh, to see your goodness so that we can pursue a life with you in the next, Father. And we just uh, ask that you would always help us to remember that and to not allow uh, the day-to-day -day of our lives to uh, allow us to forget that. Father, we pray that you would be with those who are struggling at this time and those who are uh, undergoing difficulties and various treatments, Father. We are especially mindful of uh, Fred as he's been going through his treatments recently. We're thankful for the uh, good news that he's had that things seem to be going as they should be. We pray that you continue to be with him uh, through everything he's been going through. And, uh, we pray also for Don White as he's uh, in the hospital uh, dealing with his heart, Father, and we just pray that uh, that may be resolved if that be your will. And Lord, we know there are many, many others that we could pray for that uh, are going through health issues or have lost loved ones. And Father, we pray for all who need uh, spiritual help or are struggling spiritually at this time. Of course, we all need spiritual help, Father, but we just ask that as your people, we can be the resource and the support that you have designed us to be for each other, and that we can help one another as we are striving toward the goal. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with the country, be with our leaders. We ask that you would keep them safe and you would help your will to be done in everything that is going on, Father. We're mindful not only of our leaders, but of the nations around the world where there is great unrest and even war, Father. Father, we know that that breaks your heart as it should break ours, and we ask that these things can be resolved if that be your will. Lord, we ask that you would please forgive us for our sins, that you would bless us as we study this evening. We we'll pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. 
Last time we got into Hebrews chapter 4, got about halfway through it, which is kind of the, uh, seems to be the pace so far, of about a half a chapter a week. So uh, that is allowing us, I think, to get pretty, uh, uh, pretty in-depth while still maintaining kind of the momentum of the text as the author intended. We talked last week as a kind of uh, result of, if you will, the idea of putting our faith in Jesus as the better lawgiver, we began talking about how being faithful to the, this better lawgiver. So uh, basically the idea of, okay, here's all the reasons why Jesus is better than Moses, why Jesus is doing more for us than Moses, why uh, Jesus deserves more loyalty than Moses, and therefore we should be following him, we should be putting our faith in him, uh, like you should have if you had lived in the time of Moses, although the author says, Although we both know that you really wouldn't have, even though you say you would, right? So then he gets into, okay, so if I'm having faith in this better lawgiver, well, where is he leading me? Moses was leading Israel to the promised land, right? Uh, well, where is the Christ leading me as this better lawgiver, this leader? And that's where, ultimately, uh, the author just throws a wrench in everything right off the bat. And he says, but was Moses actually leading you to the promised land. I mean, he was, but was that actually the final destination, even for your ancestors? And he begins to demonstrate, even as far back as Moses, God's plan for his people was never limited to a physical location. It was a rest that he had in mind beyond the promised land that he was giving them. And he emphasizes, going back to the creation account, Ultimately, what he had in mind for human beings is a rest similar to what God did when he rested after the creation, which is God has work to do related to this world, instantly enough. God has work to do related to this world. Once he's done, he can rest. Not meaning he's tired, meaning he can cease what he's working on. In the same way, while we're here, we have a job to do. We have work to do. The rest that Christ is trying to lead us to, the rest that even God through Moses was trying to lead them to, ultimately is a rest from the work we have in this life. It is a rest that goes beyond the promised land. And he even says in verse 9 that Joshua, he didn't ever give them that rest. Which proves to us, if there was any doubt, even though he's been implying this the entire time, proves to us the promised land wasn't the rest that they were moving towards. So instead, there does still remain this rest for the people of God that we are to pursue. And it's this lovely picture that he paints, and we won't go into all that detail because we did last week. But he's going to continue that idea as we look tonight uh, in chapter 4, and Lord willing, finish that chapter. So uh, let's begin in verse 11. As we finish out the chapter, we're still talking about this idea of being faithful to this lawgiver. We talk kind of about the distinction, right? If I put my faith in someone versus I'm faithful to someone— Essentially, my faith overflows into action is kind of maybe a helpful analogy for us in the difference between faith and faithfulness. So, uh, beginning in verse 11, well, actually, as always, let's first ask this question. He has just defined for them this amazing reward, this rest. He's offering me something that's far greater than anything this world has to offer. So really, where the author is going with all of his points, but he's going to start here, if you will, because this is his first main point, how should I respond to this reward that God is offering me through this better lawgiver? He's offering me a rest that can't compare with all the most grandiose ideas of what the promised land would be like. So how should I respond? And that's what he's going to answer as we begin in verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And of course, he's referring back to the sort of disobedience that Israel partook in when they were in the wilderness and therefore didn't enter even the physical rest, much less the spiritual. But let's go back to that first part. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Anyone have a different translation there? Labor. Labor to enter that rest? Okay, that's good. Any others? Do what? Be diligent. Be diligent. Okay, good. All those kind of capture it. Somebody else? Make every effort. Good. Okay. All those, I think, capture the essence of this idea. Strive, be diligent, labor, make effort. The idea is, essentially, we're putting forth a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of labor towards a goal. But I want us to think about what he's saying to his audience. 
So let's ask this question. What's the opposite of diligence? Again, we could put any of these other synonyms we just talked about in there. But what's the opposite? Do what? Lazy. Lazy. Okay, good. What else? What other opposites might we find of diligence? Do what? Negligent. Okay, negligent. Good. Apathy. Uh, apathy. I think both laziness and negligence, those both kind of get there, but I especially want to focus on this idea of apathy, or maybe we could even say complacency. Anyone remember in, uh, I know I'm asking a lot, but uh, anyone ever remember in high school <laughs> physics class? I don't remember high school physics class. Okay, like, mm, I get it. But Newton's laws. Anyone remember what Newton discovered about motion? Ah, good. Something that is in motion, it stays in motion until something stops it, right? Whether that be friction, whether that be, you know, an outside force like a person, you know, stopping it. But if something's at rest, it stays at rest until something works on it. I want us to think about diligence in that way. I'm not going to move, quote unquote, unless I make myself move or someone else makes me move, right? If, if I'm just going to stand here uh, really solidly and one of y'all wants to come over here and push me, okay, maybe I'll move. But until then, unless I move myself, I'm going to stay still. Well, physically we understand that, but the same is true with our efforts even beyond the physical too. Meaning, if I want to succeed at a project I'm working on, well, ultimately, I have to move myself in the direction of whatever effort needs to be done to accomplish that goal, or else I'm just going to stay still. It just doesn't happen, right? But I want us to think about the Jews. And this is not meant to be a slight on Jewish ethnicity. This is just the Jews as they are presented in Hebrews, both under Moses and at the uh, culmination of the law, which is Christ's coming, uh, whenever he reveals this new covenant, what is the Jews' attitude towards God and towards their relationship to God? And I'm not saying all of them even, but what's the general, the general sense that the Hebrews writer, even Jesus, many of the apostles, what, what do they describe as the attitude of the Jews? They're God's people, which means what to them? We're just along for the ride. We're God's people, so he's just going to give us what we need to have, right? He's going to deliver on the promises. We just sit back and let it happen. In other words, they expect that they don't have to put forth any effort. They don't have to cause themselves to be put in motion. They just sit back and God's going to do it all because they're the the chosen people. They're God's people, right? That's, I, I want us to think of how the author is presenting in verse 11 this idea of striving for, because without saying it, he's contrasting how he believes they feel about their status as Jews. He's saying, you don't get to just sit back because you're Jews. You've got to strive. You've got to work. You've got to put forth a lot of effort. Maybe if we think about in Matthew chapter 3, maybe this will kind of help us put these two things into the most vivid contrast. Remember whenever John the Baptist is uh, speaking to some of these Jews and uh, telling them you need to repent, you need to do these things, you need to be pleasing to God. And remember what he says? He says, and don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Basically, he's saying, yeah, this thing that you're relying on to justify you not ever doing anything and just, you know, coasting on the coattails of Abraham, that's not going to cut it. Well, that's his whole point in Hebrews 4.11. This takes work. You've got to strive for it. If you don't strive, even if you're just staying still, even if you're just an object at rest, you're going to follow in the same pattern of disobedience as your forefathers. So let's continue then in verse 12. Now we have a verse that is very often quoted, I would say, in many uh, passages of scripture, but I hope that as we look at it in context tonight, not that it's necessarily used wrong, 
we can at least get why it's here in this particular section. So we just said you have to strive for entering this rest, strive to enter this rest, so that you don't fall into the same, uh, same disobedience as your forefathers. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and open, or naked and exposed, <laughs> there's my uh, New King James in there, uh, naked and exposed to the eyes of him of whom, or to whom, rather, we must give account. We've heard that in isolation a lot, I would wager. Meaning those two verses pulled, pulled out and quoted. Again, probably not wrongly. But what function does this statement serve for what we've been looking at? In the overall argument, the overall point the author's trying to make why does he suddenly talk about the Word of God being living and active and exposing and all these kinds of things? What's his point? It's active. Okay. It has some action to it. Okay, good. Take action. Okay, good. So he's just said you've got to strive, right? And so now we have the Word of God being an active force. What else? Ah, okay, good. Let's, let's go back to verse 12 for a second. For the word of God is living and active. What is the word of God? The Bible. Jesus. Certainly for us, we can say the Bible. Also, Jesus is described as the word. But I want us to think, I don't think those are wrong applications as we are reading from our vantage point. But remember, what is the, what's the model he's been using this entire time to make his point? What group of people has he been using to make his point? Ah, okay. And specifically, not just the Jews, the Jews under Moses. Now, as the Jews first come out of uh, Egypt and, and the Exodus, and they cross the Red Sea and all this, do they have the law at that point? Not yet. Now, they get to Sinai pretty quick after that, and certainly they have the law by the time they start wandering in the wilderness. The point I'm trying to make is the word of God, as he's talking about here, this isn't limited in the sense that we're trying to, to see it in his, his point of view here. He's not saying the scriptures in isolation. He's saying what God says for you to do. Whether in the case of the early Jews under Moses, that was the word spoken by Moses. Whether as time went on, that was the law delivered on Mount Sinai. Whether eventually that's the law and the prophets. For us today, that would be the entire Bible because that's been collected. Or even in the first century, as uh, the author of Hebrews is talking to these people, that would also include the word of God as given by the Spirit, even if it's never written down, right? Because there were plenty of, of instances that we see in Scripture where people could reveal things by the Spirit in the first century because the Spirit was acting in that way, and that wasn't written down. We don't have all of that information, and we don't need it, right? Because it was specific to some of the situations they were in. So we're not just talking about Scripture here. We're saying when God says something, when God gives an order, when God says, this is what you need to do, however, whatever form that takes, Again, for us, as Andy said, looking back, uh, certainly for us, that's scripture, because we don't have any of the other avenues of communication today. But as we look back in history, we can see that in every possible circumstance. Anytime you have a person who has a communication from God through whatever medium that might be, that word, that message, that command, it's living and active. Let's go back to what Liz said. Living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now let's, let's, let's think about the, the examples he's using here. 
Soul and spirit. What's the difference between soul and spirit? Our life or flesh. Okay. I think that that is, based on my study, a good approximation of the difference. Are there a lot of people who understand the nuances of the difference between soul and spirit even today? Again, I mean that to say, I think there is a difference that we can discern, and I think that there, there are some things we can understand, but soul and spirit, that's a very fine line, right? And even today, there's still a lot of things we don't understand about those words and those concepts. Joints and marrow. Now, I want us to think about something. This is kind of a weird thing maybe to think about. But when the author is writing this in first century BC, my understanding historically, they weren't even allowed to like do autopsies and cut people open. That was a violation because they felt like you were you were doing you were violating something sacred to actually even uh, cut someone open after they are deceased. So their knowledge of anatomy is very very limited in a whole lot of ways. And yet, they still, I mean, you know, they've gone to war or they've killed animals or things like that. They still, you know, can discern some, you know, marrow, joints, right? What's the difference between joints and marrow? Well, essentially, the joint, right, it's, it's made up of two bones. And then inside those bones, there's some marrow. So again, a very fine distinction for them, especially without the knowledge of like cells and all that kind of stuff. Well, where does the bone end and the marrow begin? You know, all these kind of things. And of course, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All of this, I mean, we have like lasers and all these kinds of things that we can make the finest of cuts into material with. They don't even know germs exist, much less atoms. So we're talking about a sword that can make impossible cuts is the point I'm trying to get across for us. We're talking about something that can, just the finest detail can determine, are you over here or are you over here? And his point is, when God says something, he knows whether you're over here or over here. Here's God's word. Are you following it or are you not? If you're even the least bit on one side or the other, God knows. So ultimately, which is his point in 13. We have to strive for this rest, right? They were disobedient, so they didn't get the rest. But we don't only have to strive for this rest. He's saying, God knows exactly whether you're doing what you should be to gain the rest or not. There is no halvesies with this. There is no, I'm going to do some, but not all. There is no, I'm going to try and have the best of both worlds. This is... You follow God's word, and you get the rest, or you don't follow God's word, and there's no mistaking. There's no appealing your case. He knows exactly whether you're following him or not. Now, that is meant to be a very, very sobering thought. I think I had asked a question here, and I already answered the question, so my bad. I got ahead of myself. But, again, we think about this idea. How does God's word discern the thoughts and intentions of our heart? Let me ask that question in a different way, because we talked about part of it, but I do want to think about it in another way as well. From God's perspective, we can understand that, right? God knows whether I'm doing what's right or not. For us, living in the 21st century, with Scripture, no direct you know, communication from God, but Scripture at our disposal, how do we know the thoughts and intentions of our heart through Scripture. God knows. But how do we know? I guess we have to ask ourselves some hard questions. Uh, God has given us His Word, again, in this case, for us, we're talking about scripture. God has given us his word. Based on what he has said, he knows whether we're doing it or not. But he's also revealed it to us. 
So if we ask ourselves the hard questions as we study it, we can discern whether or not we are doing it or not. That's why in John, for example, in 1 John 5, we can know that we have eternal life. Why? If we are obeying the commandments, if we are doing what God has said. We can't have that confidence without the God. I think I might have told you all before, there's a card game that I really enjoy. The card game is called Mao, or Chairman Mao, depending on who you play it with, named after the horrible dictator of China uh, back in the day. And it's named that because... It's a very brutal game. It is a game in which the only rule you are allowed to share with anyone about the game is that they can't ask about the rules. The only way you learn the rules is to get punished for breaking the rules that you didn't even know were rules. It's, it's brutal, but it's, it's so funny, especially when people haven't played before. And they're like, oh, we got fresh meat, right? <laughs> okay, but think about that. Think about if that was how our relationship with God was. The only way we learn whether or not we are doing what God's word has said is if we get punished for breaking it because he hasn't actually told us what the rules are. God may have established them, these are the rules, but if he hasn't told us, man, that would be brutal. Nothing funny anymore about that. So that's part of the point. Not only from God's perspective has he made this decree and knows whether we're following or not, but he's revealed that to us so we can discern our own thoughts, our own intentions, and recognize, am I actually right with God or not? And that should be a comfort, even as it is also a high calling and a challenge, a high standard. The message of this better lawgiver, that's kind of what we have as we go through verse 13. The message of the better lawgiver, again, for us, this is scripture lets us know God's will, and serves as the standard God uses to judge us. So from God's perspective, this is the standard. He knows what, which side of the standard we're on. But from our perspective, it tells us how to follow the standard. And so that is something that empowers us, even as, to an extent, it is also very much a challenge, and can even be frightening in a sense at times. Well, let's go on to verse 14, because this is an interesting section. He's been talking about the lawgiver this whole time. Now, if you all remember, as we kind of listed out the different main points of this book, anybody know what the next topic he's going to talk about, the next big point he's going to talk about is? Jesus is the better lawgiver. What comes next? Jesus is the better high priest. Well, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. It seems like he's starting the next section, right? And this is where we see, yet again, the genius of the author of Hebrews. Through inspiration, of course. I'm not crediting it all that just the human being. When we look at this, and we'll look at it through it in just a second, he's still talking about the lawgiver. He's foreshadowing what he's about to talk about in more detail. Well, let's read through this. So, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And since we have him, let us hold fast our confession. It's that same confession he just talked about, right? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Another passage we've heard a lot and has so many beautiful reminders for us just on its own without putting it into the broader context of the argument that the author was making. We have uh, the idea of uh, Jesus being this high priest, of Jesus having passed through the heavens. Uh, the idea there, without going into too much detail, essentially their idea of the heavens Basically, you go up high enough and you get to God. Now, that's not literally what he's saying here, but that's kind of how, how their vernacular, how their, how their uh, language kind of referred to that. So he went all the way, right? You know, we, we eventually, you know, maybe they dream, oh, one day men will have, bird, or, uh, have wings like the birds and can fly into the heavens, right? Well, okay, maybe a little, little out of height, but even we can't get all the way into the depths of outer space, you know, beyond our own solar system. But the point is, he's made it all the way from where we are to where God is. 
So he says, since we have the high priest, and then he says, he can sympathize with us, even though he has passed through the heavens, because he's been tempted just as we are in every respect, so important. In every respect, he's been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so, let us draw near boldly or with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here's what we need to ask ourselves. Why does the author include this reminder at the end of this section about the better logic? Think about what we talked about last week and tonight so far. Why does he include this? Ah, okay. What has he just told them in the last three verses that we looked at? Verses 11 through, or is that four verses? 11 through 13. That's three verses. I can do that. 11 through 13. What has he just emphasized to his audience? We have a better law, a better lawgiver. So what has he said? He said, you've got to strive to be diligent, and God's standard is very high. Now, he's talking to people who have, at one time, before they became Christians, they were under this old law. They were under the law of Moses. It was a high standard, but essentially what the author is emphasizing to them is, you have an even higher standard because you have an even better lawgiver. Well, that's scary. Wouldn't it kind of almost be against what he's trying to get them to do? To say you're going to be held to a higher standard than you were under the law of Moses? His whole point is, I don't want you to go back to the law of Moses. I want you to follow Christ or remain faithful to Christ. But all of a sudden now his readers are hearing, but wait, you're saying it's going to be harder to follow Christ. We're going to be held to a higher standard if we follow Christ. Well, maybe I do want to go back to the old law. So what do they need before he moves on to his next point? If that's where they get to by verse 13. They need reassurance. They need a reminder of hope. Even with the reminder of the high standard. He says... Yes, you have this uh, enormous weight, in a sense, that you have to be aware of that God is calling you to follow, to be obedient to his word, but you have a high priest who has done it already. You have a high priest who has met the standard that you are now being asked to meet. You have a high priest who has shared your experience on every level. You have a high priest, therefore, who can sympathize with you not just from a distance, but from right next to you as a brother. Because he has gone through all the same things. Therefore, if you are actually striving, yes, it's a high standard, but what do you get? You get open access to the throne room of God so that you can ask for his mercy, which means him meeting your needs, and his grace, his favor. I want you to succeed whenever you want. Why? Whenever the first person landed on the moon, the first man landed on the moon, I say person, we're thinking the first of the human race, right? You know, the first man landed on the moon. What did that tell other aspiring astronauts? It can be done. It's possible. If he can do it, I can do it. So what does that do when Jesus, through his sinless life and his death, is able to enter into the heavens, into the presence of God? Where was the presence of God before Jesus? I 
under the old law, the law of Moses. Where is the presence of God? On what? We sometimes call it the mercy seat. Mercy seat behind the curtain. Behind the curtain. God's presence for their whole history has been locked behind a curtain on a throne that they are never allowed to see. But Jesus has entered the heavens. He's been the first one. He made it. So now he's saying, you can follow in Jesus' footsteps. Now there's no curtain. Now you can approach the throne yourself. Not through an intermediary in the same way. Jesus, as the intermediary, has opened the door to let you come in with him. Now, yes, there's a high standard. But there's also a greater help. Yes, there's a high standard. But you can directly ask of God, as James talks about as well. You can directly ask of God, and he will give. Because he wants you to succeed. It's beautiful, and we see this throughout Scripture. So often we make the mistake, and I say we in a very general sense, Christians. So often we make the mistake of highlighting one or the other of these two sides of the coin. We either highlight the high standard and don't highlight the help, or we highlight the help and forget about the standard. But the author of Hebrews is bringing both of those into this vivid picture for us. There is a high standard. And God is giving you the help and the tools to meet it. And Jesus has already met that standard. And he has paved the path for us to follow in his footsteps. That's why. Yes, he's also foreshadowing, as I just said earlier. He's foreshadowing what he's about to talk about with the high priest. But this is still part of the lawgiver section. Because they need a message of hope along with this message of a challenge and a high standard. So, as we wrap up for tonight, this better lawgiver, Christ, he offers something worth striving for. The emphasis of the first part of the chapter is he offers something better than what was being offered before. But that means it's worth striving for. It's worth working for. And if we faithfully follow him, he is committed to helping us succeed. Not just it's worth striving for. There's a lot of things in this life that we could say might be worth working for. Are all of them within reach? <laughs> I mean, I could say, oh, I want to be a billionaire. It's not a great goal, obviously, but let's say that, that was one of my goals. Well, I don't know that that's within reach. <laughs> a lot of people try for that. Very few make it. <laughs> this one's within reach. Not because of me. Because of Christ. So that's what he wants to leave them with, even as he transitions to talking about Jesus, not just as a leader and a lawgiver, but as a high priest and a mediator. And that's what we'll look at next week as we get into chapter 5. Any questions or thoughts on this one before uh, we wrap it up for today? All right, thank you all so much. Let's get out of songbooks.